Sheikha Shah, thank you so much for coming to Carlton and uh, speaking to us. It's a pleasure to have you here. Vivek, it's a pleasure being here and I've really enjoyed both the lecture in the morning and I'm obviously very grateful to you and to the center for hosting this along with IDRC. Thank you so much. I wonder if we might just reflect a bit on the theme of your, your talk, which raised a very provocative and an important question about uh, India and poverty. Could India end poverty within a generation? Um, could you share some of your thoughts on why you appear to be optimistic when other observers at this juncture are, l are less so on India? Sure. Um, Vivek, uh, as I said at the uh, outset of my talk, uh, partly to get away from the current gloom and doom, uh, I was going to take a decidedly long-term view of where India is going, where it ought to go, what the potential is that it faces, and the challenges that it must address. And when you take that long-term perspective, I think the inevitable things that one has to both consider as challenges, but also the assets that India has uh, come to mind. And in that mix, when I think about the amazing demographic transition that India is going to go through with a large section of its population so young and with such a great potential to be productive, to earn, to save, uh, that's going to be a major possibility for India. How Indian policymakers and Indian institutions gear up to that challenge is going to tell us whether that's going to be a big demographic bonus or it's going to be a big demographic onus. And in many of these situations, I think there's a choice to be made, but a choice to be made now because these are all long-term issues. Skilling is a long-term issue. Dealing with India's water-stressed nature in North India is an issue dealing with primary education, its efficacy is an issue, but these are all things that are not amenable to quick fixes. And for that reason, um, I think the uh, reduction in growth rates that we are seeing is an extremely valuable wake-up call. And it's a wake-up call for Indians, it's a wake-up call for the policy makers, it's a wake-up call for the politicians. Uh, the possibilities are immense. We just need to seize the moment. We need to do the things that need to get done and then look to the future. Since you raised the, the, the growth rate, uh, Shekhar, there's been so much discussion, chatter lately, as you know, yes. about the downward revision to the growth in the last quarter of the last year, a lower forecast for this year, um, and very mediocre forecasts by Morgan Stanley and most investment banks and public institutions for the coming fiscal year. And as someone who works on this and who thinks about it, um, do you sh share the, the, the concern or the fear that India could be slipping back into a lower growth trajectory? That we, we might have already had our run of 7 or 8% growth, and we're slipping back towards a new so-called Hindu rate of growth, not 3.5, but maybe 5%. Uh, the economist certainly seems to think so. I'm more optimistic that we can still manage seven or eight but what what's your sense of that i'm actually perhaps as optimistic or perhaps even more so and the economist called uh, its leader this week uh, farewell <laughs> incredible india as i said in my talk uh, i suspect it should have been oh <laughs> uh, incredible india so you know till we meet again um, so i think it's a it's certainly a diminution of india's star but as a friend and colleague uh, who writes a weekly column uh, uh, on India, Surjit Bhalla, uh, said to me, he asked around, and five years back he asked around, could anybody have predicted India's uh, rising star? And the answer universally was no. And then in the last six months, he's been polling his friends to say, would you have expected India's star to be falling in the way in which it has? And again, the answer was no. So I think countries and nations go through these cycles. Um, to me, what's of concern is that there is just so much at stake in the case of India. Uh, I think The Economist very rightly pointed to uh, the fact that if India is not able to regain its 7, 8, 9 
maybe even 10% growth rate, the impact on India's poor, and in general on one of the m biggest social transformations that's underway anywhere in the world, could be even bigger than the Eurozone crisis that we are seeing. Uh, so I think what's at stake is really, in a sense, the topic of my talk today, that we are in a position, if things fall into place and if the right policies are followed, and if we have a bit of luck on our side, uh, to indeed end poverty in that generation of 10 or 20 or 25 years. And that's within reach. So for me, I think the biggest disappointment comes from, but also the opportunity comes from this wake-up call. Uh, I suspect that if uh, this wake-up call is seen as for what it is, um, there is no doubt in my mind that India still as the second fastest growing economy in the world, with the huge market that it represents, with the opportunities of the demographic transition that I talked about, with the fact that when the rest of the world is in doldrums at two, three, and negative rates of growth, India, alongside China, could still be the favored destination and should be the favored destination of foreign direct investment. Unfortunately, of course, what's happened is that not only have some, uh, there's a waning of interest on the part of foreigners in India, but also Indian companies are looking abroad uh, so as to get away from some of the pessimism. Or the regulation, uncertainty, and, and certainly things that haven't helped the, the government's reversal on FDI and retail, for instance. If I can just pick up a point that you, that you made, or a couple of things you said, uh, one very crucial, that it's not growth for growth's sake, that growth is a key tool of um, to, towards combating poverty and other social ills, mm -hmm. something which the, the, uh, the economist also makes, interestingly enough, and they're hardly a left-wing sort of socialist <laughs> rag, so they recognize that, that link as well. So how do you see that connection between, is, is there sort of a mechanical relationship between growth and poverty, or what, what other policies would have to be put in place to ensure that if we do get back to say seven or eight percent, mm -hmm. or even higher, mm -hmm. that that does translate into meaningful reductions in poverty, not to mention the other facet, which is growing wealth and income inequalities. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly, there's a established uh, elasticity of poverty reduction with respect to growth, and India's numbers on that elasticity are not terribly bad. So India has reduced poverty between the years 2004-05 to 2009-10 by about 7, 7.5, 8% seven with greater reductions in rural poverty and somewhat smaller reductions in urban poverty. But the bulk of the Indian poor are rural, so that has a major impact. Um, that's with the 7, 8% growth that we've seen. Um, so there is already a built-in momentum that if India were to go back to uh, close to double-digit growth, that would continue to have an impact on poverty. Uh, at the same time, I think there is a transformation underway in agriculture, which is releasing low productivity workers from agriculture and allowing them to move into semi-skilled and manufacturing type activities. So I think that's the process that's underway. Uh, there's also been major improvements in agricultural uh, capital investments. Uh, those have grown substantially, and you can see that in the higher growth rates of agriculture that we've seen. So these are lots of positives on that front, on this connection between growth and uh, poverty reduction. But a crucial test that's out there is the ability to generate enough jobs. That is growth that is going to be focused only on services uh, isn't going to meet and take advantage of that demographic transition that we know is happening, is going to happen, there is no stopping it. And to the extent that uh, some of this growth can be in manufacturing, particularly low-skilled manufacturing, uh, it will generate the jobs which will then lead to dramatic reductions in poverty. It will lead to things like income security. It will lead to things like food security. That will release some of the current entitlements that have been built up 
in India in the last few years, during the years of rapid growth and, and rapidly rising tax revenues, those programs possibly could be even scaled back, releasing resources for more investments in skilling, for raising the skill levels of the average Indian worker, of ensuring their ability to compete in a global market. So I can see a real knock-on effects if the policy framework is there, if the right decisions are taken, uh, that generates growth and then translates that growth into meaningful poverty reduction, meaningful jobs. And which again raises another crucial question, which is given the current political configuration uh, of forces in India, I is it really likely or realistic that there could be a return to a reform-minded uh, policy framework, uh, given that the last few years have not been, uh, the last four, five years really have not uh, shown us much signs that there's going to be a serious effort by any political party, mind you, any major political party to, to sort of restart, to jumpstart the stalled reforms process. Well, politics is the art of the possible, uh, and you never know what's going to happen in politics, just as I think nobody could have predicted, maybe even two years back, three years back, that uh, there would be this sense of despondency about India. Uh, I don't think one can predict what will happen in politics, uh, and certainly uh, in as fluid a place as, as India. But most uh, thinking more systemically, I suspect that the years of growth that the average Indian citizen has experienced over the last decade um, has fundamentally transformed people's views about what opportunity means, what the state can do for them, what they must do for themselves. Um, and I think that is gradually, and we see that at the margins, but it hasn't perhaps entered the mainstream. I suspect that that concern about opportunity, about the ability to do things in a free market, in a market that is growing very rapidly, is going to build up political pressures of its own. And I suspect that irrespective of the color or hue of the politician, they're going to ha have to respond. You can see that already to some extent in the way in which individual states within the Indian Union are striking out and taking very bold initiatives in areas at and sometimes somewhat diametrically opposed to what the central government might wish them to do. And you can see that uh, across the board in the high income states, Gujarat, Maharashtra, some of the southern states, you can see that in the low income states of Bihar, Orissa and others, where uh, a, I think a new brand of leadership is coming about that is putting development first, that is putting growth first, that is putting efficiency in government first. And I think with very, very attractive results so that they are able to fuse the market for reform and for change with the market for votes. Uh, and that, when that happens, I think we'll have unleashed a tremendous amount of political energy in the right direction uh, that's going to propel India. So to me, that's the hope. The fact that Indians have tasted growth and the fruits of growth, the fact that this is a very young population with huge expectations, and that they will make their voice felt. And I think something that you raised in your talk, that many of India's young people have a very different mindset, and certainly we all see this talking to young people that we meet in India, that this is a generation that, that doesn't know Nehruvian socialism or Mrs. Gandhi's brand of socialism. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a generation that's grown up sort of post-1991 and have, and have always had a, a sort of a market system in which they operate and are, are entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. looking for opportunities. So that perhaps might cause a groundswell mm -hmm. of support working through the states up towards the center. That would be the hope. And it's very interesting that you say that because there's clearly a divide between sort of the old India and the new India. And you see the old India and some of the institutions that are still around, and you see the new India and some other institutions that are really very, very different from anything that, that the country has seen, whether it's the stock exchange or whether you think of the institutions of cell phone ownership with the levels of penetration, some 900 million cell phone owners in India. It's an amazing number. It's the largest market, uh, I think the largest cell phone market, and certainly the one that's growing the fastest. So I think 
between this new India and this old India, the tension is going to possibly increase for a while. But just the sheer size and the numbers are going to mean that the new India is going to prevail. Uh, and that need not be just the India Inc. that we used to think of, of the corporate India. It needn't just be the incredible India uh, that uh, India's tourism ads uh, promote. But I think it's really very much a homegrown India that's going to be confident, that's going to have the skills, that's going to have the ability to compete in the global market. And that's where, you know, if we look at China's example, that's where China's um, achievements have come from. And I suspect that that, that is going to be uh, the future if the policies that India follows are right. I did want to mention that, you know, when you look back historically, and again, this is going back to the old India, new India, uh, comparison. Um, a lot of Indian policy making, even if it uh, came after Nehru's time, was really firmly wedded to the idea that there were deep market failures that had to be addressed. And, and that's why the, the, the planning process, that's why sort of the license Raj and wanting to control economic activity so that the state knew what was best for its citizens, what was best for industry, what was best for agriculture. The reforms of 1991 sought to change the balance between recognizing market failure, but also recognizing that after some 30 years, there'd been just so much government failure as well that a balance had to be restruck between the two. And all the liberalization that took place in the post-91 era sought to increase competitive uh, activity sought to uh, reduce the uh, purview of the state in activities in which it need not be present, uh, but at the same time improve its regulatory powers. Uh, it sought to uh, put the balance back into the kinds of social sector initiatives that the government should be pursuing, at the same time allowing foreign competition to drive efficiency and equity in, um, in Indian uh, manufacturing, in Indian industry, and indeed in the Indian services sector. Now, those, the intent of those reforms was, was great, but I don't think they were completed. And the crucial things that were left out, uh, reform or liberalization of factor markets. And today, a lot of the problems that we see relate to these very same factor markets, whether it's land, and we've seen uh, tremendous problems in land acquisition for industry for other kinds of uses. Uh, the same problem of land in urban India and the urbanization uh, challenge that India faces. Then uh, another an important factor is labor. Labor regulation and labor market policy have not really been liberalized or reformed. Uh, as product markets were reformed in 1991. And again, we see an impact of that in the huge size of the informal labor market, the fact that the informal labor market provides a degree of flexibility that really goes beyond almost any kind of flexibility that you can imagine, but usually to the detriment of the worker usually to the inability of the employer to take the necessary risks to invest in the skills of the, the worker. <coughs> so all of these things are really a uh, result of the incomplete reform and the liberalization that took place. What was expected to happen is that after about five or seven or eight years when the fruits of that first wave of liberalization happened, there should have been a second round of, of reforms. And in a sense, that's what's been missing. And I think the disappointment within India, apart from growth rates, is, is very much about the absence of this next step and why it has not happened. And therein lies also the impatience that I referred to uh, and, and the change that is happening in the Indian electorate. One interesting comment you made in your talk, which is something that some of us have written about, is that one of the failures of the 1991 and post reforms was the failure to really make the to, to make the case to the electorate of why we're doing it what what does this serve it was done in an ambiente of crisis in a mode of stealth as you also pointed out and that seems to be sort of an original sin i've written about it in, in a, a few places that's now coming back to haunt mm -hmm. the second generation mm -hmm. reform process no, you're very right vivek um, 
and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an insight that we all wish we didn't have simply because the ground reality if were, were it to be different but because reforms took place after such a long gap that 1991 reforms really came on a mental mindset that really was derived 50s, 60s, Mrs. Gandhi's, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the whole notion of the control of the financial sector and other sorts of reforms that, uh, uh, or actions that she pursued, the nationalization of the banks, etc. So it took a long time to bear fruit. Also, because it was such a break from the past, was so hitting so hard at the kind of foundational philosophy of the early policy makers in India that a lot of it happened by stealth. Uh, a lot of it happened by stroke of the pen reforms that gradually played themselves out, whether it was in trade policy, whether it was in liberalization of industry, whether it was in liberalization of location of industry. Um, all of these things happened slowly, gradually, and by stealth that automatically or by definition uh, prevented politicians projecting the fruits of liberalization, creating a constituency for reform. And to me that's one of the biggest casualties of the long process that, uh, or the long time it took for reforms to bear fruit. Today if uh, an average Indian holds a cell phone that is one of the cheapest in the world, that has one of the cheapest service plans in the world, he or she typically doesn't associate that with competition, with free entry, with the kind of amazing transformation of the telecom sector that took place in the mid-2000s and early 2000s in, in India. That absence of a link is what prevents politicians today from moving ahead with the second generation of reforms. But I think there's room. I mean, why do we have to talk about uh, power sector reform? Why can't we project it as assured power supply at reasonable rates? So, you know, there is a change in the way in which reforms need to be projected. And again, um, that's something that's sort of getting lost in the hurly-burly of the day-to-day -day politics that seems to be ruling today. So a different sort of narrative has to be cast in a certain sense. Absolutely. And the average cell phone user convinced that it was liberalization. Right that's given him or her these very cheap, the cheapest in the world. In fact, I think it's cheaper to roam in Canada on an Indian <laughs> cell phone <laughs> plan than have a local one. Uh, and interestingly enough, there again is a sector that's been tarnished through a corruption scandal. Mm -hmm. So people, when they think about cell phone liberalization, may, might think of the 2G spectrum scam. Exactly. And not of the earlier phase of reform that opened up this whole sector. And Again, this goes back to the absence of the second generation of reforms. Typically, the second generation of reforms, almost every country, tend to address these very issues of rent-seeking, patronage, capi uh, crony capitalism, which, uh, unless they are decidedly moved out of a uh, country's economic policy framework, tend to corrode the first gener the, 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 the benefits and the fruits of the first generation of reforms. And because these haven't happened, so we see these scams, particularly in the allocation of natural resources like frequency spectrum, like mining rights, like land. So these are all manifestations of that absence. And it's a huge opportunity, and it's, it's not too late, by, by any means not too late, to get back on track uh, and to address these issues in a reasonably sensible, rational way not let the best become the enemy of the good. Uh, I think just the, op the, the, the dividends from following through with the reform process that Dr. Manmohan Singh started back in the early 90s would be just tremendous. And really sort of killing the remnants of that License Raj or what some call the License Raj 2.0 in things like land, spectrum. And others have called it now the Resource Raj. Where government still has um, discretion where, where rules are opaque, sure. then even a small tweaking of the rules can benefit a corrupt bureaucrat, politician, and business person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it opens up the opportunity to really create a social fabric that 
um, allows you equality of opportunity and the ability to for the youth of India particularly to uh, uh, aspire to jobs that are competitive that are sustainable that meet market needs allows you then to focus fiscal resources on the truly disadvantaged and the vulnerable to provide social protection schemes that uh, address really uh, disadvantaged and vulnerable sections of society, whether it's the aged, whether it's uh, those who are incapable of working, uh, those who still suffer from the stigma of India's past history of caste and communal divisions. I think it allows you then to really focus on the truly vulnerable in society and address those issues. But if the entire weight of opportunity is put on social policy and on social protection, that is difficult for any nation, irrespective of how wealthy or rich it is, to bear. And certainly India can't afford to, to entirely base uh, the whole notion of creating opportunities on just social policy. I think a policy of growth of creating jobs, of creating the conditions under which the private sector will create jobs is going to be dramatically important for India's future. So is it fair to say, as I think many observers are saying, that perhaps in the zeal to capitalize on these rich resources that came into the state's coffers, that perhaps they overdid the social policy and didn't, I think as you said in your talk, invest in the future, but rather mortgage the present generation by by creating this sort of over this overhang this fiscal overhang which we're now dealing with well um, India of course is not unique in doing that uh, almost every country that comes into you know it's like a Dutch disease as we economists call it a uh, Dutch disease problem where uh, a sudden influx of resources whether they come from tax revenues or from North Sea oil uh, create the opportunities for misuse of those resources and I have to say that they were all, and, and these are all well-intentioned policies, but I think one needs to think about not just the immediate short run and the immediate problems that uh, one solves through these policies, but you really have to look at the longer term consequences, not just the ability to pay, but the kind of society that you are creating. Do you want a society where people can get 100 days of employment and build uh, small rural roads, or do you want to create a network of roads that then lead to greater commerce, greater industry, more jobs, more uh, urbanization, more schools, and create the jobs that would then employ these people in truly productive uh, pursuits rather than simply being dependent on 100 days of employment. Now, if you can create a transition between one to the other, then of course that's great. But if it is not clear how the transition is going to happen and you just expect growth to fall from heaven, as we know from history, it doesn't. Not too many countries can sustain long periods of growth. And typically those that manage to sustain it only manage to do it for 15, 20, 25 years. Very few countries, with perhaps now the most recent exception of China, have been able to sustain those high rates of growth. So that's a, that's a fair warning to India that complacency uh, will not uh, lead to the kind of growth that India wants and needs. As we are coming towards the end of our, our time and this, this um, fascinating conversation, um, if you were sort of to, to gaze into your crystal ball, uh, Shaker, as you look forward, I, I know that you're optimistic as I am, but um, how would you rate the odds if you, can I, I can use a different metaphor, where we're going to be 5, 10, or, uh, or, th or 30 years from now, looking ahead one generation, are we going to be at least um, making a big dent in poverty, if not, if not removing this, that scourge? Are we going to be a richer country? Are we going to be, or are we going to be stuck, mired in a, what some economists call a middle income trap where we reach a certain point and then we sort of taper off. If you'd asked me how I felt about tomorrow or the next few months, that would have been a tough question to answer. But the question you've asked is very easy to answer. I'm absolutely certain that uh, India will make a huge dent in poverty in the next, certainly within the next generation, but even before that. And that uh, 
with this demographic transition, with just the minimum of the right policies that we could follow, I have absolutely no doubt that it is going to occupy and, 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 and be at its rightful place. Um, as you know, the projections for India are that India will be the second largest economy in the world. Already in PPP terms, it is one of the largest. Even at market prices, the, Indian, the size of the Indian economy is the same as the Canadian economy today. Uh, if we were to do it in PPP terms, then the size of the Indian economy is substantially greater than the Canadian economy. Uh, uh, so that I think the, the potential is there, the ingredients are all there, the wise men and women are all there. Uh, it's a matter of just putting it together. So perhaps taking a cue from our friends uh, at, uh, on St. James Street, it's not quite farewell to the India growth story. No, it's just uh, till we meet again. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shekhar. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you.